Okay, good morning. It's good to continue our study of uh, topics and issues of Emuna again after our uh, short break. If your name is not on, did you get an email? If you didn't get an email from me yesterday reminding you about the class, then make sure to give me your email address so I can add it to the, uh, so I can add it to the list. Okay, we are, yeah, I don't have that piece of paper, so just uh, leave me on a piece of paper or a note or send me an email. Okay, today for our uh, Weekly dose of Amuna. We're going to study a piece by the Nesiv Shalom by the Slanim Rebbe on this week's parsha. And though he doesn't address it, we'll try to also get in some ideas about Hanukkah in preparation, anticipation of Hanukkah, which is uh, rapidly and um, it's coming upon us. Okay, so on the bottom of the side that has Rishnun Beis two hundred and fifty-two, and we're going to study a piece based on this week's parsha that deals with uh, Yosef. Yosef's character, Yosef's personality, what distinguishes Yosef. So he writes the following, Vahi Hashem es Yosef, it's a funny terminology, God was, Vahi Hashem es Yosef, which we translate as God was with Yosef, but it doesn't necessarily sound like that in the Hebrew. Vahi ish matzliach, so God was with Yosef, and it sounds like there's a causal effect here, because God was with Yosef, Yosef was successful. He was matzliach. And his master, his employer, saw that God was with him. And everything that Yosef touched turned to gold. Everything that he was involved with in his master's home, Hashem allowed him to be successful. Also, again, interesting terminology. Everything he did, God caused his hand to be successful. Now, this is in the home of Potiphar, exactly. So Yosef is removed from his family. We spoke yesterday in the Parsha class. If you want, you can listen online about this callous and calculated uh, dismissal of the brothers of Yosef. They strip him literally naked and throw him in a pit. And ultimately he's sold to Yishma'elam, Midyanim. And he finds his way through the trade route down to Mitzrayim. And there in Egypt... He's lucky enough to be, or I should say, I guess he's unlucky in a certain sense, but he finds himself in the home of a, of a wealthy, powerful man, Potiphar. We know that Potiphar's wife seduces him over and over and over again. Yosef is in a position that he had no reason to resist. Right? You would think that many people with a lot more to lose have resisted less. Yosef had little to lose. He's alienated from his family. He has no name. He has no reputation. He has nothing. He's been thrown away by his family. And yet... He shows incredible courage and self-discipline, self-control, and, and, and really um, supernatural um, courage. We, we talk about that in another context. The, we say in Az Yashir every day, Vayar Hayam Vayanos. The sea saw and it split. When the Jewish people were trapped between the sea and the Egyptians, the sea saw and it split. What did the sea saw? What did the sea see? <laughs> what did the sea see? S-E-A-S-E-E. What was it that the sea saw that caused it to split? So the Medrash tells us, you know what it saw? It saw Arono Shel Yosef, the coffin of Yosef. The Jewish people had made a a promise to Yosef that when they left Egypt, they promised they would take his remains with them to be buried in Egypt. Kever Yosef today is in Shechem. No matter what UNESCO says, it belongs to the Jewish people. And despite their lighting it on fire, it is uh, forever ours. So what did the sea, what the, what the sea saw that made it split was Arono Shal Yosef. And how does it know that? Because the Pasuk says in our Parsha this week that Vayana um, Sachutza, that Yosef overcame the temptation of the wife of Potiphar and Vayana Sachutza and he ran outside. So Vayanas, Vayanas, that same word is used when it describes Yosef's superhuman discipline to overcome the seduction of the wife of Potiphar, Vayanas, he ran outside, and Vayar, Vayanas, and the, the um, sea also, Vayanas, it, it fled, it split. So is it just semantics? Is it a cute play on words? Vayanas, Vayanas? I don't remember where I saw it. I think it might have been the Maharal. It gives a phenomenal explanation. He says, no, you know, Yosef, the natural thing for Yosef to have done was to give in to that temptation. The, the human nature the nature of man, the nature of a young man in that situation, it would have been natural for Yosef to give in to the temptation. What Yosef did was nothing short of supernatural. He showed supernatural strength to overcome the temptation. So the sea looks at Yosef and says, if Yosef could overcome his nature, then I can overcome mine. 
the sea naturally should be one body of water. For the sea to split is supernatural. So the sea says, if Yosef has the capacity to suspend his nature and to overcome it, then I can suspend my nature to be one and overcome it and split. So what Yosef exhibits in that, in those moments, because they weren't, it wasn't one moment, it was relentless pursuit. In fact, in the, the, where they had that final episode where Yosef runs out, you know, that day, it was yesterday's Dafyomi, that day, um, the wife of Potiphar had arranged, it was a, it was a idolatrous holiday, and everyone in the household, everyone in the estate, because the Gemara asks, is it possible the house was really empty? There's got to be some workers around. The landscapers were there. Somebody was there. So the Gemara says, no, it was a secular holiday, an idolatrous holiday, and everybody was at church. And the wife of Potiphar said, I'm not feeling so well. I'm going to stay home today. And it was all a ruse because she said this was her day, that she got rid of absolutely everybody. This was the day she was going to finally get Yosef. And Yosef, it says, that he came to the house, Lasos Malachto, which the rabbis in yesterday's daft debate, Lasos Malachto, to do his work, does it mean to do his work? You know, he was balancing the checkbooks and, uh, and cleaning the curtains, he was doing his work. Or Lasos Malachto meant that was it. He was ready that day, he was going to jump in bed with the wife of Potiphar, Lasos Malachto, to do his work because he did not have any willpower left. And yet, despite her orchestrating things that they were all alone, and despite his being at the end of the threshold of his willpower, he nevertheless shows superhuman courage and strength to, to run, and that's why he's Yosef Atzalik, that's where we learn that from. That has absolutely nothing to do with what we're studying. Let's get back to what we're studying. So, uh, because you asked, yes, this is in the house of Potiphar, that's how we got to that. Uberashi, ki Hashem ito. What does it mean that Potiphar sees everything Yosef touches turns to gold? Every investment he makes, when he fertilizes the grass, the grass is growing beautifully. Everything Yosef touches is wonderful. What does it mean? What is it that Potiphar sees in Yosef? That he knows that God is with Yosef. So he answers Rashi, Shem Shamayim Shagur Bifiv. Yosef is the first, Rabbi Pollock of Mechlala is here, he's giving a shir here tonight, if anyone's interested. So it's uh, perfect. Yosef is the first Mechlala girl. Yosef, everything out of his mouth, Baruch Hashem, Mirz Hashem, Be'ezus Hashem, right? Everything he says is Hashem, 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 Hashem. And here he is, alienated from his family far away in Egypt where there is a pagan culture and he again has every reason in the world to keep Hashem to himself. Not, you know, not where your yarmulke at work, so to say. Literally and figuratively. Yosef has every reason to hide his religion, his tradition from his father and his grandfather Yitzchak and his great-grandfather Avram. He has every reason. But he doesn't. What characterizes Yosef? That in every conversation and everywhere you go, he takes the opportunity to talk about Hashem. In fact, in next week's parsha, in Miketz, you see that he transforms Paro through that. Paro summons him from jail, and Yosef's still talking about Hashem. Biladai, it's not me. Hashem ya neshlom Paro. God is going to answer Paro. When he begins his conversation with Paro, Paro is a pagan. By the time he's done with Paro, Paro says to his advisors, "Look at this kid who ruach elokim." You know, God is, is, is with this kid. God's going to answer my... God's got a plan for me, Paro says. So Yosef is the first Michalag girl. He's first, still also the first outreach rabbi. He's doing unbelievable outreach. But he, he's also a very powerful lesson of outreach. Yosef does outreach not in a frontal way. He doesn't try to indoctrinate. He doesn't try to make people feel guilty. He doesn't preach. He doesn't come at them. He very subtly says things like, you know, someone asks, how are you doing? Oh, thank God, I'm doing well. Listen to this crazy story that happened. And look what God did for me, how it worked out. It's unbelievable. Thank God. Or with God's help, or if, if, if God wills, just by using God in your casual conversation, you don't know the impact you can have on others. So what does Potiphar see in Yosef that he knows that God is with him and attributes the success in his house to Yosef? That Yosef's dropping God's name all the time. Mirz Hashem, Be'ezr Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Thank God, with God's help. V'haramban hevi medrash. The Ramban brings the Medrash. Shahiya Malachash Venichnas Malachash Viyotse. Shahiya Choser Tamit Shivisi Hashem Lenagdi Tamit. Yosef was always muttering. He was always whispering. He was always talking about Hashem. And what was his philosophy? What characterizes Yosef? What can we learn from him? Shivisi Hashem Lenagdi Tamit. As it says in the beginning of Shulchan Aruch. Shivisi Hashem Lenagdi Tamit means I will place God before me always. 
It means that there is an awareness and a mindfulness and a cognizance that in everywhere I go and everything I do and everything I say and every decision I make, God is next to me. God is next to me. Not next to me like the policeman. Not next to me like the IRS agent. Not next to me like... He's next to me like my loving friend, like my loving father. He is escorting me through life with love and with affection. But obviously I'm going to speak a certain way or I'm going to um, make certain decisions if I realize that God is escorting me, He's with me in everything I do versus if I think that I left Him in shul. Right? If my attitude is, I spoke to God, and God's in my life, I, I left Him in shul. I saw Him this morning when I dove, and I'll see Him again at Mincha. Or, say, a woman who doesn't go to shul, yeah, I see God when I light the candles Friday night. Or I saw God when I took a few minutes to dive in the morning. You know, but in between, I'm kind of on my own. I'll report back to Him later. You're going, it's going to have a very different day, a different mindfulness, different decisions, different way of speaking, different everything, than if you feel, not I left God and I'll see Him later, but He's my companion through life. He's with me. His guiding hand is on my shoulder in everything that I do. And that was Yosef. I see Hashem before me always. I don't remember if I told this story here, but I've told it many times. But the example of I was at a bris many years ago, and you know the way a bris is, as the, hours, as the time goes by, people go to work and the table's empty and empty and empty. And then you're at a table, it's just you and one other person. And now you have to go to work. So you feel it's rude. You're going to leave that person sitting there by themselves. So I was with Rabbi Finman, and I was at a bris, and I had to go to work. And I said, I'm so sorry, Rabbi Finman. I feel terrible leaving you alone. I don't want to be rude. It's just that I have to go. So he looked at me, if you know Rabbi Finman, he's like, it's okay, brother. I'm never alone. Hashem is still there with me. And he wasn't like lip service. He actually felt like, I'm at this table. I'm not alone. I got company. It's okay. Don't worry. You can leave. I'm not alone. Right? Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit. That wherever you are, you're driving somewhere in your car, you don't need the radio on. Talk to Hashem. Fill him in. Tell him what you're happy about. Tell him what you're protesting, what you're upset about, what you're disappointed about. But in every, again, decision, action, behavior, where Hashem is with us. Amalo Adonav. So what happened? Potiphar said to him, Mazog Roschen, Vine Roschen. I need you to pour boiling water, and the water, behold, was boiling. Mazog Potion, Vine Potion. I want you to pour cold water, and behold, the water was chilled. The Chashel Adonav, Kimasek Shafim Huzeh. So Potiphar came to the conclusion, I hired some kind of magician. I hired some kind of witch. This guy's unbelievable. I don't know how he pulls this out of a hat. Everything I ask him to do, it's exactly right. <clears throat> and he does it in an instant. What's going on here? So I'm alone. So Potiphar first suspect, suspected that, that Yosef was bringing witchcraft and sorcery down to Egypt, and he said, okay, Egypt is the capital of witchcraft and sorcery. Right? Part of the whole experience of God taking us out of Egypt was that we leave that behind. My Rabbi Rav Shechter always points out that the Jews were taken out of Egypt, we were supposed to leave the superstition in <coughs> Egypt. That's their philosophy. We, Tamim Tiyem Hashem Alakecha, we leave superstition and sorcery and magic behind, and we are supposed to live a life where Shivisi Hashem, to us it's all about Hashem. And what happened? We did leave Egypt and successfully, but the Jews have taken some of Egypt with them in the form of a red bendel around their wrist, and in this uh, mishigas, and this narishkite, and this superstition, and this skula, and this... So Rav Shechta says, you've taken Masay Mitzrayim. You're supposed to leave Egypt. You've taken Egypt with you. We're supposed to shivisi Hashem. All we turn to is Hashem. We rely on, we turn to, we depend on, we put our trust in, we put our faith in. Not a red string, and not a funny, uh, you know, skula, superstitious behavior. That's not who we are. It's not what we believe in. So at first Potiphar thought, okay, Yosef's going to fit right in here. This is the capital of superstition and sorcery and witchcraft and magic. And this guy is some kind of magician. Everything he does is successful. Everything he does, he's able to transform. <clears throat> until he saw and realized that the Shekhinah was Omedes al Gabav. Yosef had this aura. Because when you walk around and you say, thank God and please God and Baruch Hashem, isn't God good? Thank you, Hashem, this is a delicious apple I'm about to bite into. If you walk around that way, the people we know who actually walk around that way, there's a glow, there's an aura, there's something magnetic, there's a charisma, there's a chain, there's something about that person, the Shekhinah actually dwells on that person. And Potiphar saw that. Vayad Hashem And says the Ramban, that's when Potiphar says to Yosef or to his other advisors or employees, wow, Hashem Ito. 
God is with this young man. This isn't witchcraft or sorcery. This is a spiritual guy. This man is spiritual. The Ramban explains that it was to bring honor to Yosef that Potiphar was able to see this glow of the Shekhinah. Whether Potiphar saw it in a vision and a dream, or he saw it while he was awake, like there was a cloud around Yosef, and therefore he was able to attribute where did Yosef's great success come from? Because God was with him. Says the Slan Marebi, this is the level, this is the character of Yosef. He was constantly stuck to God. Right? We spoke about in the past, the Meshach Chachma says that Bitachon or Dveikos is God says, stick with me. Whatever you're going through in life, stick with me. Stick with me and I'll take care of you. Yosef stuck with God. He's stripped naked and thrown in a pit, he sticks with God. He's sold in a caravan down to Egypt, he sticks with God. He's working in this household, breaking his back, he's sticking with God. He's falsely accused by the wife of Totivar and thrown into prison, he sticks with God. What's the result of all of his sticking with God? That God had a master plan. And the master plan left Yosef, the second most powerful man, not only in Egypt, but in the world. And he's in this incredible position of power, and he brings his family down to Egypt, and they are reunited, and so on and so forth. He stuck with God in all of these moments where many others would have walked away, would have abandoned. He remained confident that there is a master plan. There is a purpose. There is a puppeteer, there's an orchestrator of the world. And life has meaning and purpose. The universe is organized not randomly, and the universe is not chance, but there is a greater plan to the world. And if I just stick with God, stay, I don't have to understand it, I'm sticking with it, right? We say to our children sometimes, you're too young, you don't understand it, just stick with me. Just stick with me, I have a plan. Trust me, it's going to work out. Trust me, you're going to be happy. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. So God says to us, trust me, I have a plan. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Trust me, it's in your best interest. But just trust me. Stick with me. If you stick with me, there'll be a plan. Yeah. Did he have his emunah when he was young? Or did all these things that he went through mold him into having... That's a great question. Right. In other words, was he predisposed towards this emunah or was the emunah the result of having endured these challenges? I don't know. Probably some kind of combination of the two. Look, he definitely was favored by his father. He grew up in Yaakov's lap, so to say. And Yaakov is, Emes Yaakov is this great, great, one of our avos, this great man of Emuna. So he certainly inherits a tradition and a legacy. Yaakov, Yitzchak, Avraham. I mean, he's living with the greatest. These are the people who discovered God, who are promoting God. They are God's marketing agency. Um, so certainly he's living in an environment that is saturated with emuna, but he takes it to another level. He takes it to another level because he lives it in the hardest of circumstances. He lives it through feelings of abandonment, isolation, and being alone. And he takes it to another level because he sees Hashem with him in everything he does. You know, it seems like Yaakov and Yitzchak, they talked about Hashem, but when they were giving lectures about Hashem. Yosef takes it a step further. He doesn't just talk about Hashem when he's on the soapbox preaching about Hashem. <clears throat> he's talking about Hashem when he's having a cup of coffee and he tells the barista, you know, this coffee is, isn't God amazing? This coffee is delicious. Thank God. for whatever. Just inserting God into everything so that there is an, an aura of spirituality and of godliness. Uh-huh. Yes? Would you say that people that both rely on challenges in life have more of an opportunity to get closer to Hashem because of what they've been through? I mean, if they have a smooth going... Yeah, for, yeah for, there's no doubt about it that um, the challenges lend themselves to exploring, looking for, relying on, leaning on, and feeling closer to God. Or and away, correct. Like well, well, it's a risk reward. In other words, it can, it can, you know, it's and it's not only true in, in the relationship with God. I, you know, I see all the time that when from the period of engagement, if a couple is having a difficult engagement mm-hmm. through life. If, they, if they're having fertility challenges, if God forbid they lose a child, if they're having financial struggles, those things can bring them closer or those things can drive a wedge and put them apart. And the same is true in our relationship with God. It can be used to bring us closer or it can become a wedge that drives us apart. Chidush Arim says that's the punishment of the snake. The snake, after the episode in the Garden of Eden, I hate to blame 
all the women and they shear the women, but it's your fault. The uh, snake in the Garden of Eden, so, um, right, the snake seduces Chavah, seduces Adam, and, and so on. So, each of them have their punishment. Women struggle through childbirth. Men have to break their back to work in order to bring in, in a livelihood. And what was the snake's punishment? It will slither on its belly all the days of its life and eat from the dust of the earth. So the Chidush Arim says, eating from the dust of the earth is a punishment. You know, for us to wor- eat, we have to work. You have to plant, and you have to, you have to pl- uh, plant, <coughs> water, harvest, grind, knead, bake. Right? We have to do a lot of work. If you eat the dust of the earth, the dust of the earth is endless. You always have your meal. So what kind of punishment is that? That's a blessing. So the Chidush Arim says, you know what the punishment is? The Chidush Arim will have no relationship with God because he will never, the snake will have no relationship with God because he will never need anything. Never need anything. You send your kid away to college and you say, here is a credit card with endless credit. God bless my gesund. How often are you going to hear from your kid? You get your kid a debit card and they need to, right? One of my daughters, every time I see her number on the caller ID, I answer by saying, you need the card or you need money? The car or money? What do you need? My car keys or more money put on the card? Which one do you need, right? And, and it's usually, right? But, right, but, but if not for my car and my transferring money to the debit card, I'm not sure how often I would hear from her. So being in a hard, that's part of why there's a tradition that the Imaho suffered with infertility. Why is it that they had to suffer? Because Because when we're put in a circumstance of our back against the wall and we're looking for help everywhere we can, so sometimes it causes or forces us to dig deep and to find trust and faith and amuna beyond. So absolutely. So maybe Yosef's being in these hard circumstances contributed to his ability to live with this amuna. Because he was with him, everything he did, he was successful. We're on the left column. I think that's what that's referring to. In the name of the Rambam. Whoever clings to God, if you stick with God, you are not treated with harsh judgment. And if you stick with God, by definition, everything you do will be successful. Because if you define success as feeling Hashem's presence in everything you do, so if you welcome Hashem in everything you do, by definition, you will have success. You may not have success in, in getting that job, or in, in conceiving that child, or in achieving that desired result in that moment. But going through that experience with God will create the success of a relationship with Hashem, which is much more eternally pleasurable, lasting, and fulfilling than even that which you seek in this world. So not to suggest you should give up on it. The person who wants the job, or wants the child, or wants the shidduch, or wants the shalom bias, or needs the parnasa, obviously needs that result. But the matzliach, the hatzlacha, the success, is, is guaranteed if you go through it with God. The success of feeling closer to God is guaranteed if you go through it with God. Only when you stop in clinging to Hashem, as Right, the Rambam, and he's quoting here from the Rambam, the Rambam believes that divine providence is reciprocal. And it makes sense. The more you trust God, the more God is going to be directly involved in orchestrating your life. And the more you say to God, I'm good, don't need you in my life, I got it covered. God says, you're good? Okay, God bless, you're good. Right? Your child who reaches out to you for help, you go above and beyond and you're protective and you want to do whatever it is. And the child who pushes you away a little bit, then you say, okay, you're going to have to learn the lessons the hard way that life treats you. If, if, if you're not involving me in your life, then you're going to have to navigate life and kind of learn it the hard way. So the Rambam says that's how God's providence works with us. The more He's in our life, the more we talk about Him, trust in Him, place our faith in Him, stick, stick to Him, cling to Him, the more He's intervening on our behalf in our lives. And the less we're relying and depending on him, the more he says, okay, you got it covered. God bless you. You're, you're on your own. Yes? Is that just on a personal level? Or could that be like with Israel? <clears throat> Israel That's right. a good question. Is it on a collective national yeah. level as well that we say mm-hmm. we got it covered? Um, I think it probably is on a collective level as well. That's why we have to, as a, as a people, also put our faith. I find nothing more heartening, nothing more moving than when you see videos of of Israeli soldiers dancing up and down to Misha Ma'amin Lo Mefached and, you know, uh, or that wedding or and so on and so forth. So you're right. 
And, and, and I think that the harder it gets in Israel, the more, not the less, collectively the Israeli people are putting their faith in Hashem. Like Yossi Klein Alevi spoke about, you know that song, Misha Ma'amin Lo Mefached? We like to think that it's written by some chassid with long payas. It's written by an Israeli rock star with no kippah. That's why Misha Ma'amin Lo Mefached. Right? So if a secular Israeli with no yarmulke is writing the words, whoever has faith in Hashem is not worried, doesn't fear, psh, right? So, so I think we're doing okay. Please God, we're doing okay you know, in that area. So when you stop, that's when we're vulnerable. If you see yourself as separated from Hashem, so Hashem is separated from you. And that's simply reciprocal. That's not His choice, that's yours. You are now exposed and you are now vulnerable to, every, to all the elements that are out there. You know, if you welcome Hashem in your life, Hashem is watching over you, He's protecting you. If you say to Hashem, I'm good, I've got it covered... Hashem withdraws, and by Hashem withdrawing, now you are exposed and vulnerable to everything that's out there. Our most righteous fulfilled this concept of seeing Hashem in everything they did. They tried to have a consistent, constant mindfulness about God the whole day. Get into the car. Oh, God, thank God I got a car. Oh, thank God I stepped on the gas pedal. It goes. Thank God. Please, God. Talking to God. Just talking to God all day long. And this was the level of Yosef. And it was, it was um, built upon his level of being holy and pure. And now he's going to develop the Son of Rebbe that there is a high degree of association, there's a great correlation between seeing Hashem, being mindful of Hashem in your life throughout your day, and living a life of Kedusha Tahara, living a life of holiness and purity. And that makes sense based on this model. Why? Clinging to Hashem is highly connected and correlated with living a holy life. They came into Yosef, Hisnahe Tamid, turn the page, Bikdusha Uba Tahara. Since Yosef was always practicing holiness, Bikhola and Yanim Hagashmiim, he was not looking at that which didn't belong to him, be it Potiphar's material possessions and be it Potiphar's wife. He was able to show great self restraint in the pursuit of living a holy life. Bikhola Tsrachem Agufni and Baloisir Taito. Why does that make sense? Why does that make sense? Because if you're tempted to use foul language, vulgar language, well, if you feel like God's right next to you, He's your companion through life, you know, you're not going to talk that way. You know, there are people I talk to sometimes and they let a vulgarity slip and they go, I'm so sorry, Rabbi, I forgot I was talking to the Rabbi. You know, it's like, okay, so they have no problem talking like that elsewhere. And they think, oh, when you're talking to the rabbi, you're not supposed to let the vulgarity slip. So, I'm not suggesting, imagine you're living with the rabbi constantly, or he's your companion. But imagine Hashem, if Hashem is your companion through life, you may not watch exactly what you're watching on TV at that moment, if he's sitting on the couch next to you. And you may not say that Lush and Hara while you're having coffee with your friend if Hashem is sitting in the third chair. And you may not speak with that vulgarity or that language. And you may not forward that email. And you may not do that thing if you felt that Hashem is in your life next to you. Right? So if one can cultivate and refine themselves to carry themselves through life with this feeling of Shivisi Hashem and Disame, that God's with me every moment of the day. I am mindful of God's presence in my life every moment of the day that's going to overflow onto the other areas of our life. It's going to create greater mindfulness in how we speak, and what we do, and what we look at, and what we listen to, and where we go, and so on and so forth. Yes? What are some of the tools you have found over the years to help you create that vessel of mindfulness? Mm. To create what? The vessel of mindfulness. You're probably a much better person yeah. to answer that question than <laughs> yeah, you could probably give us a Meditation, you yoga... <laughs> Acupuncture, massage, no. Um, no, but you've evolved. I, I have evolved and I'm still Don't definitely evolve. evolving. Um, it takes tremendous, 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 tremendous effort. It's mindfulness. I mean, it is, it is, the, it is choosing to be mindful. It is remembering to constantly come back 
and to be mindful. I think that it is the essence of Judaism. I have a, a book that I'm writing. When I say that I'm writing, it's in my head that I'm writing it. <laughs> Not in reality at all. But I, I really, I, ha- I, think, I think I have an idea for a book which would be a great, great contribution to me because I would learn from it while writing it and, and maybe to others. You know, in, in psychology, in self-help, that is the key word today that everyone's talking about, mindfulness, 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 mindfulness. And I believe that Judaism is designed to be a platform of mindfulness from telling us how to tie our shoes when we wake up in the morning to being mindful when you came out of the bathroom about what a miracle it was that your plumbing was working, to being careful about what you put in your mouth and what comes out of your mouth, to how you conduct yourself in business, to every single aspect from the moment you wake up with moda'ani, to wake up with gratitude, with mindfulness of gratitude, to the way you go to sleep, to be mindful of forgiving anyone that hurt you that day. That Judaism is a framework which is entirely all about mindfulness. So I have a book written in my head where the first few chapters are defining mindfulness and quoting all the secular literature about what mindfulness is and then going through how Judaism is the prescription for a mindful life from kashras to lashon hara to prayer, gratitude, to dress, to every aspect of chapter and it could be geared towards a secular Jewish or even non-Jewish audience because I think it provides wisdom for everyone but I would have extensive scholarly footnotes that show that this is all based in you like how much I've thought this through? This is all steeped in, it's all steeped in Torah. In other words, this is not some like newfangled, new age idea I'm making up. But if you go through Chazal and Midrashim, you will see that this is exactly what the rabbis saw in Halacha. Halacha is not some dry, punitive law to have some restrictive life. Halacha is a platform for a life of mindfulness. So what I've tried to work on and what I think is true is that, is to be mindful. You know, if you come out, if you make a pledge that when you come out of the bathroom, you're going to say Asher Yatzer, that's contributing to a life of mindfulness. You know when you start saying Asher Yatzer, God forbid? When the plumbing breaks down. A person who lives on a catheter for a period of time, a person who has to take certain medicines, a person who has GI illnesses or diseases, a person who has emergency, you know, a person who struggles in that area, boy, do you say Asher Yatzer. So why can't we say Asher Yatzer before? Why can't we say Asher Yatzer before? It's just an example. You know? And you don't have to be the most religious person in a firmak and see yourself as being one of them to say Asher Yatzer. You could just decide that I want to remember with gratitude the miracle of my plumbing working. The wonder that you could put food in on this end and that the body is designed to absorb what it needs from the food and to eliminate what it doesn't. That's, that's unbelievable. That is an incredible, insane miracle. Every time it works, it's a miracle. It really shouldn't work. There's a tremendous amount that could break down. And if you're Ashkenazi, you know all about it. There's a tremendous amount that could, that could not work in the GI system and the urinary system. There's a tremendous amount that could break down and not work. And so there's an amazing article by Dr. Prager that was published in a medical journal about the bracha of Asher Yatzar. And he tells the story about a young man who was in a car accident and it left him with nerve damage. I know I've told this before. I use all my material over and over again. So... I encourage you to read that. But, you know, Asher Yatzer is an example. Um, making a shahako before you drink your coffee to realize that, God, black coffee is the greatest thing ever. Taste of it, the caffeine part of it. You know, w- there, there are no shortage of opportunities throughout our entire day to do things that will promote mindfulness. To decide that I'm going to wake up, you know, in, when I've been involved in outreach, one of the first things I do often is I translate and transliterate Moda'ani and I give it to people to put on their bathroom mirror. Right? I mean, you should say it when you open your eyes, but at least by the time you get to the bathroom mirror when you're brushing your teeth. Imagine the mindfulness about the way you start your day with an attitude of gratitude, with appreciation that, wow, I woke up. God renewed my contract. I have a reason to yet exist. I have a purpose to fulfill here. So throughout the entire day, there's opportunities for mindfulness. Yeah, Orly. I think also you could, in theory, if you are a mindful person, I mean, I think it's a great idea to write a book. You should be able to create, if anyone wants to ghostwrite it for me, feel free to. If you should be able to create a nation of mindful people because your kids will pick up on that. Yep. So if you, if you get to that point at the end of your life, it might be too late. But if you have a parent that was mindful, I mean, I just think of my father, for example, certain things the way he was. And even to Eli, with his mom, like, I don't know, washing your hands in the morning. Like, some people are stricter or they, about certain things because they saw their parents do it. Right. But if you're always sort of... Um, presenting that mindful way of life with like saying the bracha, everything you do really makes so much sense. Right. And 
your kids will grow up that way. And it sounds like really easy sort of No, no, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. Right. The people who talk about who's who like Yosef Atzadik, Shem Shemaim Shkura Bafiv. Hashem is dripping from their lips and everything you do. So if you say to your kids, not did you make a bracha? And you grab the candy because until you make a bracha, but you say, <clears throat> Did you thank Hashem for that candy? Right. You can't take the candy without thanking Hashem, it's stealing. Aren't you this candy is delicious? Did you thank Hashem for it? You know? I give you Yechevah credit. I was in Israel when this happened, but, but you see it. If you talk about... I've said this before also. Forgive me, Yechevah. But I used to think about when our older, oldest kids were young, I thought, it's so silly the people who talk about Hashem. The kids don't understand Hashem. We don't understand Hashem. Aristotle doesn't understand Hashem. You're talking about Hashem to a two-year-old and a three-year-old and a four-year-old. But then we changed a little bit and tried to work on that with the younger kids, and you see its impact. So my Tamima went to the doctor last week to take her big cast off and put her small cast on two weeks ago. And Yechevet sent me a video, not while driving, of, uh, of her in the car. She was davening to Hashem and asking Hashem, please don't let this hurt. And in the, in the office, you could tell the story, in the office... What? Hashem, please don't let it hurt me. Like, what the doctor That's <laughs> unbelievable. Right, the doctor's like, who's Hashem? <laughs> That's incredible. She did a kid's Hashem. Right? And the back says, it's you and you talk to her this morning. But now I have to thank Hashem for not letting it hurt me. Oh, my God. Right, so that's, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a special huge. neshama. And hopefully that, now the question is in life, how can you make sure that life doesn't get in the way to undo that in a sense of a, of a six-year-old? But, but that's the payoff. That's the payday. That if you talk about Hashem, then a kid feels, I have to ask Hashem for help before I get to the doctor. While he's doing it, I'm screaming at Hashem, don't let it hurt. She's not going to forget that. I hope not. Well, she's not I hope not. I'm not going to forget Because right? kids have that's, no inhibition. That's be so she's screaming she's at And then on her own, she's saying to that. Hashem, thank you afterwards. That is, that should be see Hashem l'negdi samin. Yosef HaTzadik and Tamima HaTzadik. So that's, <laughs> that is, that is seeing Hashem in everything you do. And that leads to this life of, of Kedusha. I want to bring it to Hanukkah for two minutes because Hanukkah is starting Sunday night because I think this mindfulness of seeing Hashem in everything is, is part of what Hanukkah is about as well what is the holiday of Hanukkah about? you know the famous question that Beis Yosef asks why do we light the candles for 8 days? we should light it for 7 days they had enough oil to last that first night so the first night's not a miracle so the, the holiday should be 7 days not 8 days the miracle was that the oil that could have lasted one day, lasted eight days. So the one day is not a miracle, just the seven days. So why is the holiday eight days? The famous question is a book, a hundred answers to this question. This is a, a famous question. But I find one of the most compelling answers is that, are you suggesting that the first night wasn't also a miracle? Who said that when you put a spark to oil, it should light, it should burn, it should provide fuel and warmth and energy? Even the mundane, even the ordinary, is extraordinary. That's what the holiday of Hanukkah is about. It's about seeing the miracle in the ordinary, in nature. So the first night also is a miracle. Who said that oil has to light? Even that. And that's what, that's what, um, that's what the holiday of Hanukkah is about. You know, we sing in Mo's Tur that these are B'nai Vina Yemei Shmona. These are days of eight. It doesn't say eight days. It says these are days. Remember Sesame Street brought to you by the number... So these are, so these are days brought to you by the number eight. What is the number eight? It's the one above nature. The natural order is seven. Seven days of creation, seven days of the week. Eight is one above. These are days of eight. Hanukkah are eight days where, you know, the candles, the, the Hanukkah candles are supposed to illuminate the world where you see in the ordinary, extraordinary. You see in the natural, the miracles that are all around us. And that's why we say Allah Nisim, for the miracles God performed by Yamimahim in those days, Ubizman Hazeh, and today. There are miracles happening every single day in our lives if we open our eyes. So Hanukkah is lighting the candles that illuminate the world, that open our eyes to see the miracles that are happening around us every day. That even the first night is a miracle. Not just the seven nights it wasn't supposed to last, but even the first night that it lasted. To see. The ordinary is extraordinary. To see the natural as miraculous. To see God in the mundane, that is the essence. These are Yemei Shmona. These are days of eight. You know, there's a special school. You're supposed to not... Too many people light the candles. They get that out of the way. And now the presents. They go do that in another room. And they go fry the latkes. And they go to the Hanukkah party. And the candles are neglected. Poor candles are by themselves burning somewhere. They were lit for one second. But you should do everything you're doing around the candles. And while the halacha is you're not allowed to benefit from the candles, right? You can't, the Gemara's example is count money next to the candles. You shouldn't, you know, make your list next to the candles. But you should be in the presence of the candles. Because it's the candles that the imagery of their illuminating our lives. Mosif v'holich. You light one the first night, you keep going until you have a full candelabra of eight 
burning candles, of a big light opening up our eyes to the world around us and to the conversation we should have with our children, grandchildren, with ourselves. Isn't it a miracle that we have potatoes to be able to cut into latkes? Aren't they delicious? Isn't it a miracle we have this roof over it? Isn't it a miracle we have the wherewithal to buy you presents? Isn't it a miracle we're in a loving home? Isn't it a miracle you just went to the bathroom? Isn't it a miracle, you know? I know, I'm harping on that. Isn't it a miracle? But aren't these things miracles? That's the holiday of Hanukkah is it's eight days for us to be like Yosef HaTzadik. Shem Shemayim Shkur B'fiv. It's eight days to emulate Yosef and see Hashem in absolutely everything and drop, drop Hashem's name in everything that's going on. And when we do, when we do, then our Kedusha B'Tahara, it's going to elevate our whole level. It's going to change the way we think, that we talk, that we eat, what we say, how we dress, where we go, what we do. If you feel Hashem is my companion as I'm, as I'm picking out of the closet, Hashem is my companion as I'm choosing what to watch on TV, Hashem is my companion as I'm sitting down with my friends schmoozing about life, Hashem is my companion. If I feel His presence in my life, it will elevate absolutely everything that I do. We're going to end here, but we didn't finish the piece. The last thing he says is, this is an unbelievably high level. To get to the level of Shadisi Hashem and Nagdi Summit, that Hashem is with you always, psh, that's unbelievably high. So he says, what's the intermediary step? How do you get to that? A step closer? He quotes from Chazal, from our rabbis, that you surround yourself with people who are mindful of Hashem. If you are part of a community of people, and that's, I think, what we're doing here on Wednesday mornings, if every week we get an injection of Amuna, we're part of a community of people, right? We, we talked about maybe creating an Amuna WhatsApp group where people can share. You know, and one of the things that happened in their life that day, or here's a great article, or here's something to think about. Just people who are committed to being mindful of emuna in their lives. But if, if you're struggling to get to, and we all struggle to live that high level sustained of Shavis Yashem and Nebi Samid, then the path towards it is to surround ourselves with other people who are committed to that level as well. So, have a wonderful day, a great Shabbos, and an early happy Hanukkah.